Miss Ross here. Uh, Liz has been an activist, a historian, she's been involved in the gay and women's liberation movements as well as socialist politics since the 1970s. She's also a renowned author and has written several books um, that people can pick up at our bookstore on Dedication Doesn't Pay the Rent, the 1986 Victorian Nurses Strike, Rebel Women in Australia's Working Class History. Yeah, I got it right. Yeah. Rebel Women in Australian <laughs> Working Class History. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're eager to speak. Uh, Dare to Struggle, Dare to Win, the BLFD registration from 1981 to 1994. And of course today, Liz will be launching uh, her book, Revolution is for Us, The Left and Gay Liberation in Australia, which you can pick up at the back of the room for a bargain price of $20. So without further ado, I'd like you to please warmly welcome Liz Ross. <laughs> Friday night I heard for the first time the poetry of the Russian revolutionary Vladimir Mayakovsky and one of the lines of his poem 150 million written during 1918-1919 struck me as a wonderful image of the struggle for LGBTI rights and he just a single line but he said a thousand rainbows will shake the sky sex and sexuality was and has continued to be a compelling issue for the left Contrary to much of the negative commentary on the left's involvement in the struggle for the rights of the oppressed minority that we, we do refer to today as LGBTI, the overall history um, of the radical left and the fight for liberation is a positive one. The left has brought analysis, organisation and a focus on what unites us in our fight against the common enemy, capitalism. It has argued the case for total social change, for revolution, not just for reforms. It has had a political influence far beyond its actual numbers, initiating some of the major actions. And left activists were founding members of many of the organisations, movements and campaigns. Understanding why capitalist society has oppressed and repressed homosexuality was, and still is today, one of the left's most important contributions to the struggle for gay liberation. Understanding where oppression comes from, what are the forces we have to fight, determine what sorts of movements we build, what allies we seek, and ultimately how we can fundamentally change the world we live in. In 1974, CPA member Dennis Freeney described one of the fundamental bases of left-wing organising and he said, it was about organising an activist minority that could bring people in around more left-wing demands and then build a stronger fighting movement. The main job then was to go out and confront those institutions that oppress us, involving mass work such as demonstrations. And I'll quote directly from Freeney now. He said, we've got to find these demands which are really challenging, not the lowest common denominator. We've got to start from real felt oppression and at the same time link it to the real causes. Some context is necessary to understand the history of left involvement in the gay liberation struggles. Left wing groups in Australia have been many. Most have been small. They frequently split, disappeared and reformed, with every group spending its <coughs> earliest period focused on establishing its basic theoretical stance. The CPA, for example, the Communist Party of Australia, had 26 people from quite disparate backgrounds at its formation in 1920 and took some years sorting out what it stood for. It has only been when the parties have some political clarity that they have been able to grow and start to have some impact. All this means that, by and large, they cannot set the agenda for the struggle, although they can choose or prioritise the campaigns they join or support. On top of this, the Communist Party, whose history of involvement with the issues of sexual freedom is a major element of my book, was under fierce attack for the, by the state for its first three decades and to a lesser extent thereafter. It was threatened with banning and at one time actually banned. Its premises and those of its leaders were raided, its members jailed, and for many decades it was subject to the draconian censorship laws. 
While the intensity of the Cold War and McCarthyism was not as high here as in the US, CP members were frequently targeted on the job, many sacked and blacklisted. Today I'm going to talk about the positive history of the left and gay liberation in Australia. However, while I won't be looking at the two left groups that have been actively homophobic, uh, that's been covered ad nauseum by critics of the left, I'm not going to airbrush out the problems, the times when the left, influenced particularly by Stalinism, took a step back or just didn't step forward. So, not surprisingly, revolutions have led to gains for lesbian and gay rights. The two great revolutions, France in 1791, Russia in 1917, are emblematic. In France, the revolution resulted in the effective decriminalisation of male homosexuality and the subsequent Napoleonic Code of 1804, incorporating these law changes, was widely adopted throughout Europe. Equally influential was the Russian Revolution of 1917, with its sweeping changes affecting all aspects of life, including the decriminalisation of homosexuality in Russia. In 1920, a leading young Bolshevik, David Kanin, wrote in his account of the times, and I'll quote, in the name of revolution, did we suppress in ourselves explosions of feelings and the flesh? No, a thousand times no. As historian Gregory Carlton wrote, people could not remain silent in the midst of a revolution which was the most audacious effort in history to free people, including the freedom to love as they chose and to put an end to prejudice. 1917 also inspired socialists in Australia. Victorian Socialist Party member Amelia Lambrick wrote about a time of rapid movement Old methods, old ideas, old, old um, conceptions are in the crucible. Changes, vital and far-reaching, are making themselves felt. Even earlier, the Socialist Party had had a progressive attitude to the questions of sex and women's rights. There were quotes from and references to Oscar Wilde and Edward Carpenter in The Socialist, the party's paper. So there were extracts from Wilde's The Soul of Socialism, Carpenter's poem, England Arise. There was no reference to their homosexuality or any reprinting of their homosexual texts and ideas. However, sexology texts such as those by Havelock Ellis and Kraft Ebbing, as well as by Carpenter, were listed and works by Russian revolutionary Alexandra Kollontai, along with Frederick Engels' path-breaking The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, were frequently reprinted. Now, what I'm going to do now is start a sort of slideshow which will refer to various texts that I refer to in my talk, but I'm not actually going to point to the things that sort of more or less following um, what I'm doing, so if you want to do it now. In 1917, the Socialist Party firebrand, John Curtin, later of course to become Labor Prime Minister, wrote a glowing review of Edward Carpenter's Love's Coming of Age. It wasn't in the Socialist, it was in a, party that, in a paper that he had in West Australia. Though there are no direct reference to homosexuality in the review, Curtin talked of daring tentative suggestions in the book, which undoubtedly referred to homosexuality among other topics. Curtin thought love's coming of age should be circulated widely, even amongst the young. Sex and sexuality in the early Australian socialist and communist press primarily came up in five contexts. Marriage, birth control, prostitution, sexually transmitted diseases and censorship. In dealing with the sexual questions in a positive light, the CPA, like earlier socialists, were in advance of society. However, there can be no denying that such discussions did not reach the heights of the Russian Revolution. Neither did the socialist or communist propose legislation similar to the Napoleonic Code. And even though a number of homosexual writers were quoted and their books listed, homosexuality itself was never mentioned in the Socialist Party press and rarely in the Communist Party publications of these early days. On the front page of the first edition of their paper, The Communist, in 1920, the party published Adela Pankhurst's Communism and Social Purity, an appeal to women. Pankhurst argued that communism will abolish prostitution. It will give young men and women the opportunity of marriage 
based on mutual love, because it will remove poverty and drudgery out of the lives of everyone. And although the article did explain how capitalism degraded sexuality and forced women into prostitution, as the title indicates, it was more sort of moralistic than revolutionary. Later articles in the paper were more progressive. Ellen Maud Morgan, for example, argued that communism would mean the very taste of life for women, concluding, if women become rebels, the socialist revolution is in sight. But with the defeat of the Russian Revolution by Stalin and his supporters by the late 20s, alongside the defeats of the revolutionary uprisings in Europe, the CPA came to embody, as Phil Griffiths has argued, a profound contradiction. The CPA was way out in front of the rest of society on the question of women and other oppressed groups. But the heavy hand of Stalinism led them in a more morally, more sort of socially conservative direction. Stuart McIntyre writes about how Kollontai's emphasis on sexual liberation gave way to Clara Zetkin's interview with Lenin, where Lenin is described as arguing against Zetkin's more permissive attitudes. Now, we have a slightly different um, interpretation of that, but that's sort of what happened. That's the way McIntyre describes it. Anyway, he's, he goes on to say, the CPA Central Committee sent out a circular drawing attention to Lenin's rebuke and warned against loose practices. Leader J.B. Miles repeated the warning at the 11th Congress in 1935, and I quote, he says, Bolshevism de um, demands a steel-like character, and that has to apply on sex questions as well as other questions. It was a retrograde step. The party Edna Ryan had known at the beginning of the 1930s, writes Joy de Moussey, one in which sexual freedom was practised and a drag queen, queen was um, welcome as a member, gave way to one in which, apparently, uh, any leading member had to consult the Central Committee before leave, entering or leaving a relationship. Looking at the CPA publications, where homosexuality did appear, it was mostly associated with right-wing figures or was viewed negatively until the 1950s, when more neutral references um, began to appear. However, all during the 30s, the party was attracting the young and rebellious, and many women novelists and activists joined the CPA. Included in that number were authors such as Jean Devaney and Christina Stead, whose novels included lesbian and gay ma male characters portrayed in a relatively sympathetic light. It's also clear from a number of memoirs and other reminiscences, such as Edna Ryan's that I've just mentioned, that there was acceptance of homosexual members within the party alongside some condemnation and expulsions. Censorship was a major issue confronting the CP and that brought it up against the sex question. With Australia's censors promoting themselves as the British Empire's last bastion on morals, it's not surprising that they targeted the CPA and met resistance from the party. Left-wing books such as Collantides regularly faced the censors' ban and the frequent charges of obscenity for political books, left-wing literature and even scientific texts, which um, has been used many times since, drew the party into a more broad-ranging protest against censorship. And it wasn't just overseas books, magazines and films that were prescribed. A number of novels and plays written or performed by CP members here also attracted the censor's scrutiny and the party's active defence. The 1940s saw an opening up, an end to the unknowing for gays, as Gary Wotherspoon puts it. Now, I'd argue while the 1920s may have been the beginning of such an opening up, the rise of fascism and the destruction of the world's biggest homosexual rights movement in Germany in the, in the 1930s crushed the spread of this movement and as well, as I said before, the impact of Stalinism. Wotherspoon sees two events during the 1940s as pivotal for the future. The first was World War II, which provided many women and men with a wider range of sexual experiences, including for many homoerotic sexuality and love for the first time. The war, he says, and I'll quote, acted as a catalyst for dramatic changes in social and in particular sexual behaviour. There was more public space available rather than invite only private parties. Hotels became the place to socialise and there were more places for cruising for men. 
When the police closed venues, new ones were soon opened. Now, in what appears to be Australia's first gay ride, it came, it came in the 70s, after police tried to shut down one of the bars in Sydney. Now, I'm not going to be able to do a really good impersonation, but there's a drag queen called Melba on, on the stage, and one of the cops came in and told her to get up. And so Melba puts her hand on her hip and says, just supposing you come up and get me, you big bull. <laughs> well... <laughs> All hell broke loose after that, until Melba, with a triumphant cry, crowned the officer with a flower pot. <laughs> so the second was the Kinsey Report. The first in 1948 about men, the second in 1953 about women, reinforcing what the war had demonstrated, that lesbians and male homosexuals were there in numbers in society, albeit still a minority. The war and the Kinsey Report were followed by two international events um, that were hugely influential. There was the increased state repression of homosexuals, including lesbians who hadn't been criminalised during the Cold War, and a sex scandal in the UK in 1953, which led to the establishment of the Wolfenden Inquiry into the laws criminalising prostitution and male homosexuality. The increased repression of the Cold War, Wotherspoon argues, had exactly the opposite effect in the long run. As homosexuality was more talked about, even negatively, its heightened profile encouraged more questioning about social mores, more acknowledgement that homosexuality existed. Now, returning to the 1950s, um, for homosexuals, this decade was both a symbol of repression and yet also of a certain freedom and even the promise of something better. Sexuality in general was more open, and far from being dull, as many describe or remember it, the 1950s proved to be just as political and sexually challenging a decade as the archetypal 1960s. Marilyn Lake writes, the decade of the 1950s has come to be equated with the uninterrupted rule of the arch-conservative Prime Minister Robert Menzies the waging of the Cold War at home and abroad, and the traditional role of women, you know, supposedly happy in their condition of house arrest. But we know, as we know from Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique and Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, and from campaigns such as the anti-nuclear movement and the battles against attempts to ban the Communist Party, there is another side to this period. So Lake continues, Yet in attributing such uniformity and homogeneity to a decade, in accusing it of such self-satisfied complacency, the conventional view fails to acknowledge the social and political insurrections that provoked the very repressions that occurred. In post-World War II society, both women and men were encouraged, albeit only within marriage, to have fulfilling sex lives. John Murphy writes in Imagining the 50s, that ideas of what was modern played a key part in this model of marriage as partnership. Many of the arguments women journalists made in defence of equal pay, of married women's right to work, and of the idea of equality within marriage were framed as rights, a resistance to which was outdated and pre-modern. Thus they spoke of only a diehard disputing women's right to work and condemned those men clinging to the old idea of wifely possession. Sexuality had never entirely gone off the agenda and was now flamboyantly displayed in the mainstream society as rock and roll arrived on the scene. Rebellious young, mostly working class people, the so-called bodgies and widgies, who embraced this culture were backed by the CPA when they were censured by the press and sort of society in general. Tribune, the Communist Party paper, wrote that attempts at individual expression as a form of personal revolt against capitalism are not peculiar to this generation. It contrasted the rebels of the 50s to what were called the lairs and larrikins of the early 1900s who came good in the fight against conscription in 1916 and 17. Or the jazz babies of the 1920s who joined the later struggles in the Depression, some becoming active socialists. The paper argued that the rebellious behaviour of young people had a legitimate cause. Facing our bodgy boys right now is the threat of being conscripted for up to five years under Menzies' National Service Bill to be sent to fight America's battles anywhere in the world. 
The Sunday Sun was roundly condemned for attacking widgies in their dress style on the back cover while running an advertisement inside uh, promoting just such clothes for teenage girls. <laughs> and then Tribune writes, typical of our hypocritical press, publicise erotic behaviour, play up sex and then with righteous indignation <coughs> condemn the morals of the day that they helped to corrupt. But homosexuality as something positive was still a hidden topic. Literature with lesbian and gay content or by known homosexual writers such as Han Su Yin's Winter Love, Radcliffe Hall's Adam's Breed, Oscar Wilde's work, the poetry of Laurie Collinson, whom I'll talk about in a minute, and Walt Whitman continued to be listed by Tribune without once mentioning homosexuality. And while the party's opposition to censorship and its more progressive stance more generally in relation to women and Indigenous Australians, would normally have put it on the side of a homosexual emancipation. The impact of Stalinism meant that they t it tended to align itself with more conservative um, calls to defend the family, albeit on, on a slightly more left-wing basis than, than society at large. And its response to the Kinsey report um, illustrates this. It's actually on the board now. Um, it illustrates this profound, you know, what Griffiths called the profound contradiction. Critical of Kinsey's report on women, Tribune wrote, and I'll quote, their appetites whetted by his earlier book on sexual behaviour in the human male, the capitalist press seized hungrily on his similar study of the human female. His subject was sex, the staple food in capitalist cultural diet. But then their criticism highlighted some of the flaws in the study and had a more left-wing attitude overall. And, he, and they said, and I'll quote again, Kinsey presents his subjects in a vacuum, but they don't live in a vacuum. They live in the US. They are women who face a day of grinding toil and nagging worry as to how they are to feed and clothe their children and themselves. They are reminded constantly by every available means that their sex is a marketable commodity. All of the women and their men are subject to the psychological war of the Wall Street war planners. Now there's certainly so, you know, so, um, an amount of truth in Tribune's commentary, but they saw nothing positive in Kinsey's research. The reviewer didn't see that for lesbians and gay men, knowing that there were others like them was so important. Now, while the 1940s and 50s had led to homosexual reform groups being established in the US and UK, Australian homosexuals established no such groups. And the picture of the young man on there is Laurie, before this, this one was um, Laurie Collinson. And the, this was one attempt to actually set up a group like, like this in Australia. In the aftermath of the Wolfenden Inquiry in 1957, a homosexual law reform group was set up in Britain to push the government to enact the committee's recommendations. After contacting the British group, Laurie Collinson, who was a poet whose poems were widely praised in Tribune, he was a homosexual and he was a member of the CPA. He attempted to do the same here. He certainly had support and had gathered a number of names of both homosexuals and heterosexuals who were prepared to be part of a group, but none were prepared to go public. The group was still born. Collinson left Australia shortly after, never to return. He did, however, join reform groups in London and welcomed the Gay Liberation Front in, you know, in sort of glowing terms. For Rod Anderson, uh, Laurie's partner for some of the earlier years, um, wrote a book about his experience as a, as a gay person um, called Free, it was called Free Radical, which we're selling upstairs. He was in the CPA from 1945 to 62. And he, he felt that the risk to the par party partially justified its public silence and sort of attitudes. And he says, because the party was under attack so much, they had to be careful. That's got a lot to do with this party's slightly puritanical attitude to sex. As to whether the party should have supported law reform, he felt gays hadn't joined the CPA to change these laws. Rather, while change would come, it was still some decades in the future, and so it wasn't necessary to put gay rights demands on the agenda right then and there. He also considered it less a political issue than a social one, and felt for the party that it was the same. <coughs> 
Now, Collinson obviously thought that the time was right and had a different attitude, um, you know, wanting to begin a campaign for law reform. Teacher and CP sympathiser Bill Leslie um, argued that there were real limits to what organising at that time could have achieved. He commented that you could only speak about homosexuality in the context of crime. You couldn't do more, he adds. Also, you couldn't organise amongst gays until homosexuals became self-aware. You needed that before you could talk about homosexuality in a different context. The changes that had been slowly gathering steam in the 1950s exploded in a radicalisation that rocked the world in the 1960s. Vietnam was the issue that brought hundreds of thousands into the streets and saw a significant growth in left-wing forces. Throughout the 1960s, as the Communist Party welcomed the global youth rebellion, the references to sex and, for the first time, drugs increased in its publications, and the party started having meetings on these topics. The CPA did still lag behind liberal society when it came to taking a stand on homosexuality. Um, it abstained as, as an organisation, um, though some of its members may have, been, may have been involved, from church and civil liberty groups calls for law reform, and CPA members do not appear to have been involved in some of the early debates that took part on several university campuses from 1963. Nonetheless, where homosexuality was mentioned, the coverage in Tribune was more positive. One article defended a young working class man while criticising the police who'd entrapped him. Another condemned the use of slurs such as, you're a dunce and a poofta, during the training of conscripts. In 1966, the paper printed a relatively sympathetic review of the lesbian play The Killing of Sister George. The article was critical of the lack of a searching analysis of the problem of lesbianism, but said the play approached the issue in a rather sniggering and weak-wristed way itself. But this was also the first use of the word lesbian in its pages. The decade, the 60s, ended in Australia not just on the high note of a general strike and a rise in working class combativeness, but with the first for homosexuals who came out ready to take a stand. For Australian gays, the end of the decade, and I'm looking at two years, 69 to 70, condensed into those two short years the growth in awareness and political organising that occurred in the US and the UK over the previous 20 years and have re which had reached its um, climax with the Stonewall riots in New York of June 1969. Over these two years, 69 to 70, four homosexual rights groups formed, as well as the women's liberation movement. Um, the Homosexual Law Reform Group in Canberra, apparently with no homosexual members, though I think there, were, there was one. The Australasian Lesbian Movement, um, then there was CAMP in 1917, the Campaign um, Against Moral Persecution in 1970, sorry, and, for the first and, and it became, for the first time, a national gay rights organisation organised by homosexuals themselves. And the fourth was in country New South Wales, where the CPA had a, had a serious presence. So the CPA at this time was on the brink of major change, the impact of the 60s rebellion and the rise in working class struggle, the post-Stalin era and the fallout for the events in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, which led to splits, political reorganisation and renewal. The party was also facing a new challenge, the arrival of two Trotskyist groups, the SWP, influenced by an American group of the same name, and the IS, aligned with the British SWP and the International Socialist Tendency both of whom, in Australia at least, were children of the revolution, developing out of the radicalisation of the time, supporting the liberation movements alongside a commitment to socialist revolution. However, it was the CPA that was the first of the left-wing parties to back the cause of gay liberation. Peter Murphy argues that the party rapidly recognised the importance of gay liberation and gave it quite a lot of impetus. In fact, the Communist Youth Group had supported homosexual rights from 1971, while it took less than a year after gay liberation appeared for the party to change its public position <coughs> and adopt pro-gay policies. In Lance Gowland's story, we see how some of this played out. Lance was based in the New South Wales town of Goulburn, involved in the trade unions and secretary of the Goulburn <coughs> Trades and Labor Council. With parents in the CPA, he'd been in the Eureka Youth League and the Communist Youth League, and before joining the party. 
In his early days in the EYL and the CPA, he didn't identify as gay, but by the late 60s, realising that he was homosexual, brought about big changes in his life, though he remained committed to the CPA. He got a gay rights group going in Goulburn, but coming out was hard in 1969. The police were onto us, he said, and they were raiding our homes, um, parked outside when we had meetings. And then he remembered that he and others started to say about, you know, the other movements, hey, what about us? We were against the American invasion of Vietnam. We wanted to be part of the great upwelling of the social movement struggle. So he moved, to, to, moved in 1970 because everything was happening in Sydney. I was very excited by it and I wanted to come and join in and take part in it. And he became one of the prime movers in the party's development of its gay liberation policy and strategy. Now, gay liberation was the last of the radical movements to appear on the Australian political scene. However, it was also, unlike the earlier great gay groups that I mentioned, Camp and the Australasian Lesbian Movement, um, a clearly revolutionary movement. GLF's first leaflet, um, Gay Liberation Front, they named themselves, that was named after the, the North Vietnamese um, NLF. Uh, the Gay Liberation Front's first leaflet in 1972 explained, Gay liberation has a perspective for revolution based on the unity of all oppressed people. There can be no freedom for gays in a society that enslaves others through male supremacy, racism and economic exploitation, that is capitalism. It's no surprise then that the demands of, the, of gay liberation would mesh with those of the radical left. While students formed the initial gay liberation group at Sydney University, it was the CPA which first promoted the GLF's revolutionary politics even before a group calling themselves that name was formed. Dennis Freeney's article, Gay Liberation, appeared on the 26th of May, 1971. Freeney reminded his um, readers of the Russian Revolution's gains, the links between GLF and the women's and black movements and the anti-Vietnam War struggle and how the demands for liberation were part of the socialist agenda. The article was just the beginning of the development um, of the CPA's political stance within the party and Phil, Phil, I'm going to quote from Phil Carswell um, who's graced us with his presence here today. Very pleased to see Phil coming along to the, to the launch. Phil said, um, describes a debate at the CPA National Congress where a gay rights resolution was put up by Freeney and other openly gay members. And he said, I don't recall the debate being acrimonious or hostile, but I do remember a lot of well-meaning working class comrades really struggling with it, re really finding it hard to say, why is this a revolutionary issue? But people understood shared oppressions. There was a solidarity between people. It resonated with their experiences as either members of the working class or as women or as indigenous or migrant. The gay rights re resolution passed. In fact, Phil found anti-communism amongst lesbians and gay men outside the party was a far greater problem than homophobia within the CPA. Now, you've seen some pictures of some of the early um, marches. In 1970, uh, Camp said that um, there wouldn't be a, a demonstration in Australia for at least 20 years. Well, in October 1971 was the first demonstration, so, and it went on from there. But it wasn't all street marches during Gay Lib's first years. Almost every radical group during the 60s and 70s had its own manifesto, describing oppression um, by the capitalist state um, and arguing how to bring about change. And Gay Lib um, adopted the London um, version, and which said, before we can create a new society of the future, we have to defend our interests as gay people in the here and now. So the manifesto called for an end to discrimination at work, sex education that recognised the validity of homosexuality, and an end to police harassment and psychiatric treatment. And the manifesto concluded, we do not intend to ask for anything. We intend to stand firm and assert our basic rights. If this involves violence, it will not be we who initiate this, but those who attempt to stand in our way to freedom. Debate about activism and theory were part of the development of gay liberation. The CPA, the SWP and the IS took up the argument for socialism in this political debate. 
At the beginning of 1973, for example, 80 activists collected at the Communist Party camp, um, a mixed bunch of labourers, seamen, university lecturers, high school and uni students, as well as an old age, some old age pensioners, apparently. Uh, papers by Dennis Altman and then CPA member Pam Stein were a call to radically restructure society while Barry Prothero and Lance Gowland debated vanguard group or mass group and relations with the left, especially the CPA. As I describe in the book, there were two phases of, G of the gay liberation movement in Australia. The first phase, 71 to 73, saw, the, as I said, Australia's first gay demonstration, the first arrest for gay activism, as opposed to being arrested for just being gay, and ended with the first national action, the Gay Pride Week of September 1973. And the, uh, the, they, when they announced the Gay Pride Week, they said, we want to bring the idea of gay liberation, first of all, before as many gays as possible, and second, confront the whole of society with our oppression and our demand for liberation. Gay Lib welcomed solidarity from heterosexuals at the Gay Pride events. It's also going to, and this is a quote, it's also going to involve those heterosexuals who identify with the gay movement against the oppression of homosexuals. That's important as it's too easy to view all heterosexuals as our oppressors when these are people who are questioning and changing their attitudes towards us. But the end of this first period also saw a change in the politics and the fragmentation of the movement. The radicalisation was ebbing worldwide as the bosses went on the offensive and the working class started to retreat. Although the left was influential here, the theoretical leadership was still coming from the movements in the US and England, where radical feminism <coughs> now predominated. <coughs> Identity politics and separatism meant that socialist politics of working class alliance and mass struggle were being pushed to the sidelines. By the mid-70s, the adoption of radical feminism, radical lesbian politics, was a political choice by the majority of gay and women's liberationists in line with the rightward shift in the political situation here and the rest of the world. While the radical left organisations had an impact out of proportion to their numbers, their small size put real limits on their ability to argue for and win the alternative case for socialist politics. And not all on the left rejected the whole of radical feminist critique of Marxism, with some calling for a Marxist feminist amalgam as outlined in books such as Heidi Hartman's The Unhappy Marriage of Marxism and Feminism. Some gave more ground by arguing for the primacy of the woman question over class, as Craig Johnson described it. Despite this shift, in 1975, there was a second wave of gay liberation which saw a renewed focus on class and socialism. <coughs> it was sparked on the campuses by a newly formed homosexual caucus in the National Student Body, which is called the Australian Union of Students, or AUS at the time, and it was at their national annual conference. The caucus, as Phil Carswell described it, a coalescence of talent and experience in one critical mass included a new layer of activists from the CPA, SWP and IES. The caucus won AUS conference adoption of pro-homosexual motions and a campaign to take these to every campus across the country for student endorsement. It was a golden opportunity for the left, which they took up and organised on the campuses around. Um, and, the, and the vote won. AUS also agreed to fund a series of national homosexual conferences. Hundreds turned up every year, 600 in that first year of 1975 in this very building and was a complete shock to everybody who came because they'd never seen so many homosexuals in Australia together. <laughs> but it provide, you know, provided a forum for the left and for others to influence the politics of the movement. The conferences also enabled the left to shift the focus to gays as workers allowing the movement to approach unions for change, for solidarity, and to put their case for a workers-led socialist revolution. Already in 1973, the BLF and the New South Wales Teachers' Federation, amongst the first organisations of any sort to take a stand for gays, had supported two students at Macquarie University. In both cases, um, the unions were headed up by members of the CPA and it was the adoption by the CPA of policy supporting liberation for gays that gave these union leaders um, the, the sort of the political arguments um, 
to be able to raise the issues and win support in the workplace. And a key role in winning peak union body support for gay rights on the job, other than lesbian and gay activists themselves, was played by the Working Women's Centre, headed up by another CPA member, Sylvie Shaw. An openly socialist homosexual grouping of lesbians and gay men was launched by CPA members just before the second national conference in August 1976. They issued a manifesto, as I said, manifestos everywhere, aiming to provide a theoretical basis for left-wing gays to organise around. It outlined the role of the capitalist family in gay oppression, why sexism and, the women's, and women's liberation mattered and why socialism was the solution. The manifesto discussed the early gay rights movements and the gains of the Russian Revolution of 1917. It also took a, took a stand against Stalinism and the parlous state of gays in China and Cuba um, at the time, where the revolutions that took place under the influence of world Stalinism tended to reflect the Stalinist position on the homosexual question. I mean, obviously it changed for Cuba later. The manifesto argued the case for common interests between working class and homosexuals. Socialism could only come through the revolutionary seizure of state power by the organised working class, the only class with the potential to lead a revolution because of its size, organisation and base at the point of production. Since both the working class and homosexuals had a common interest in the abolition of capitalism, then there was ground for principled alliance and they you know, likewise with women and blacks. And they concluded the manifesto, solidarity with each other's struggles today provides the basis for tomorrow's unity on the barricades. <coughs> but by the end of the 1970s, gay liberation was no longer. Its limits had been reached. Revolution was no longer in the air and the focus was on reform. Craig Johnson summarised the process as changing the political framework from oppression to discrimination, from liberation to rights and from movement to community. The turn to community politics, including the rebadging of Mardi Gras as a festival rather than a protest, rather than signalling the rebirth of gay liberation, marked the end of this phase of liberation politics. One of the badges from 1978 declared, Mardi Gras was a riot, now we need a revolution. The early gay liberation had promised revolution, but by the end of the 70s and 60s, Revolutionary ha fervour had passed and there was a worldwide downturn in political and industrial activity. The revolution had been postponed. None of this can take away from the real gains of gay liberation and the role of the left in founding and building such liberation movements. It was transformational. It changed lives, millions of people's lives worldwide, with its defiance and pride. In Australia as elsewhere, the movement and the activists that built it made it possible for people to live, work and love more freely. Discrimination and oppression still existed, but Gay Lib gave lesbians and gays more strength to continue the fight against discrimination and laid the basis for the campaigns to come, such as Equal Love Campaign of today. And I'll conclude on this next part here. But overall, it was Marxism and the left political organisations which brought all those issues into a coherent world view and outlined a strategy for change that linked the fight of all the oppressed with class struggle against the system of capitalism. The strength of the communist position, and I'm going to embarrass Phil again, um, I'll quote from him, is, he says, the strength of the communist position was that it drew this absolute connection between the fight for gay rights, um, homosexuality, feminism, fight for gay rights, and the fight against capitalism, that they were inextricably linked. It gave people a chance to have a worldview and an organised political response. Thank you.